For roughly six years following the release of GoldenEye on the N64, every Bond game was being compared to that classic. The next game after it was Tomorrow Never Dies on the PlayStation 1, which tried to change the formula by being a third-person shooter instead of first-person. Unfortunately, that game was a piece of shit. So EA stuck with the FPS formula for 007 games for the next few years and just made other changes. Then 2004 came along and EA tried to change the shooter types again, but this time it was actually done for a good game. It's 007 Everything or Nothing for the GameCube. In this game, Bond has to stop an ex-KGB agent turned terrorist from using nanobots and platinum tanks to take over all of Russia, and then taking over all of Europe. While the story is not as outlandish as Agent Underfire's B-movie plot, it's still pretty sci-fi, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It definitely has the complexity of a real Bond movie. It most importantly provides fans with an entertaining 007 adventure. As time went on, we saw third-party developers put out more impressive games on the system, and that was definitely true of 007. This game's visuals have very noticeable upgrades from Agent Underfire and Nightfire. The textures are smoother, the animations and effects and movements are higher quality, and the characters look more like actual people. For GameCube standards, anyway. The bigger thing here is not only does Bond actually look like Brosnan in this game, but sounds like him too. Probably because Mr. Brosnan actually lends his own voice to the character for the whole game. Yes, we once played bridge together. He lost. This alone makes the game feel like much more of an authentic 007 experience, as Pierce delivers a great performance in this game, as do the supporting cast members such as none other than Mr. Willem Dafoe, who still needs to play the Joker, playing the main villain Nikolai. You've come on a fool's errand, 003. Sometimes I think MI6 assigns your numbers based on your IQ. A friend of yours? You'll have to do better than that! Add in John Cleese, Judy Dench, and Richard Keel, among others, and you've got the perfect 007 cast. With such a great cast along with the music and sound effects, it's easy to see why some fans consider this Pierce Brosnan's fifth Bond film, just that it's interactive. Now by and large, Everything or Nothing is a much better third-person shooter than Tomorrow Never Dies. You get behind cover, hold L to lock onto a bad guy, then you can aim your shot with this little dot found within the crosshairs, allowing you to shoot dudes in the head, hands, or kneecaps. I specifically point out those parts because the baddies will react to being shot in different parts of the body. Get a headshot and they die. Shoot them in the hand, chest, or legs and they'll recoil from the pain allowing you to either get a headshot or melee them. Now this whole system does work well most of the time, but the game is from the era before Gears of War standardized how to do third person cover based shooting, so some shooting mechanics will feel clunky to those used to modern games. It doesn't help that you can't shoot someone and actually hit them without first locking onto them, unless you're using the sniper rifle or playing one of the on rails levels. But if you'll pardon the pun, Bond fans should get a kick out of the melee combat system which has more effort put into it than prior 007 games. By pressing the X and Y buttons, Bond can punch, kick, throw, disarm, and slam his enemies into walls. These can be difficult to execute if enough henchmen have guns and shoot you first, and some of the reactions look cartoony, but it looks really badass when you pull off a good hand-to-hand -hand takedown. It's a party. The game for the most part gives you the freedom to shoot everybody up, use the physical takedowns if possible, or the third option of stealth. Stealth is well designed with Bond being able to sneak walk behind an enemy and choke him out or shoot him with his silenced handgun. Of course Bond gets some help from Q Branch with a temporary invisibility cloak for himself and his car. Sure that's very much science fiction but the gadgets always make a Bond adventure more fun. And Q provides you with plenty of cool toys like the coin grenade or the Q spider, a little robot used to reach places Bond can't for more items or unlocking doors. The game also stands out for having more vehicle levels. Whether it's a motorcycle, car, or helicopter, they control well and are packed with very useful weapons. Well, except for the RC car that moves too fast for its own good. Sure, it leads to the over-the-top explosive chases that are more insane than the tank chase in Goldeneye, but that's part of what makes for a fun Bond game. 007 fans crave those exhilarating chases. All of these elements come together for a game that immerses you into a true 007 adventure with cinema's best James Bond going toe-to-toe -to -toe with worthy adversaries, including a classic villain providing some fun boss fights. Most 007 games are known for their four-player death matches, but Everything or Nothing focuses instead on a two-player co-op mode. You and a friend play as two characters made solely for this mode as you work together to shoot your way through a series of levels based on the main game. Within two-player are two additional modes besides co-op. Race, where you two try to finish the level within a time limit, and Scramble, where you actually compete to see who can get the most points. 
Co-op and its three modes are all solid fun and unique additions to this Bond game, another way EA attempted to change the formula and succeeded. Unfortunately, you can't play as Bond, but worse than that is the Arena mode. It's the only four-player mode, it has only three maps that each have to be unlocked in co-op, and it's a zoomed-out, top-down perspective. What could have been a great multiplayer mode worth unlocking everything for is instead a clunky disappointment that'll make you want to play Nightfire instead. Despite its flaws holding it back, mostly in multiplayer, this is still a great Bond game, particularly for those who favor the Bond films of the Pierce Brosnan era. It can be found for pretty cheap these days, around $5 to $10. Honestly, the single player alone makes this game worth getting at those prices. If you can find it in that price range, it's worth a purchase. And that's my review of James Bond 007 Everything or Nothing for the GameCube. If you like this review, check out my previous reviews of these other 007 games on the Cube, Agent Underfire and Nightfire. See you all next time! Sorry, gentlemen, but I have a train to catch.